Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along on the first morning of Level Up Week 2021. Today, I'm going to be talking all about the Shape Up technique and how my team has been using it to ship work that matters. So here am I. Um, for those of you that haven't met me, uh, my name's Tom Walsh. I'm a software engineer here at Redgate. I joined just over three years ago, and I'm currently working in the governor's team, which is responsible for our DPP solution. And before that, I worked on SQL prompt and SQL search. So um, quick agenda for the session today. I'm going to start with a whistle stop tour of the shape up technique. So you've got a little bit more context before I dive into some more details. I'm then going to cover how we went about implementing it. Um, in the governor's team, how we felt it's been going so far, some of the problems we encountered and kind of solutions we put in place to remedy those. And then I'm going to go through some common questions that I feel people are likely to ask um, based on this. So um, if I kind of answer your question in advance, I apologize, but feel free to ask any additional questions at the end, because um, I should hopefully have a few minutes for Q&A. So let's dive straight in. What is ShapeUp? It is essentially the name for the software development process developed at and used by Basecamp. Now, Basecamp are a fairly well-known, um, small but quite outspoken software development company. Um, and they've been getting quite a bit of negative press over the past few weeks um, for some diversity, inclusion, and workplace culture issues. Disclaimer here, this talk is in no way an endorsement of any of those beliefs um, of the people that work there. I just think it's a really, really cool technique and I wanted to share it with you today. And one of the main reasons I wanted to share it is that it takes pretty much every traditional concept that we know and love in inverted quotes of agile software development and sets them on fire and throws them away. And it's all built around the idea of a six week cycle. Now at Redgate, lots of us work in kind of fixed, maybe two week sprints, um, or maybe a more lean Kanban style approach. Um, but Basecamp advocate working in six week cycles instead, which is a little bit different. And they say that it's, it's enough time to build something really meaningful and solve a proper problem for your end users. But it's also not too much time that you can't see the end from the beginning. So you're not setting off on some big three, four, five, or even six month project and be quite disheartened because you can't see the end. And each six week build cycle is followed by what's called a cool down period as well. And that's two weeks where there's no scheduled project work or anything like that. It's a time to maybe relax, maybe try out a few ideas that you've been considering, fix bugs, maybe pay down some technical debt that sort of stuff. So that's the idea of six week cycles. And the rest of the process is split into three main stages. The first of those is shaping. And shaping is working out the key components and elements of a solution before you actually commit to building it. So rather than just diving straight in and saying, we're gonna build this thing, and then finding out there's loads of complex unknowns that you didn't really think about before, you think about those at the beginning. It forgets the idea of estimates and instead focuses on appetite. So rather than saying, this is what we want to build and asking a team, how long do you think this will take? You say, this is the problem that our users are facing. How long do we actually want to spend on fixing this problem? And then you shape your solution around that. And your appetite is one of two options. It's either a six week big batch project. So that's for some really gnarly customer problems where you wanna spend quite a bit of time on it, or it can be a one to two week small batch project. So this might be either adding a small feature or maybe tweaking an existing feature. And obviously in a six week build cycle, you'll probably be able to schedule maybe three or four of these small batch projects together. And finally, a shaped piece of work is written up in something called a pitch. And I'll cover a little bit more detail about pitches in a few minutes. Next up is the notion of betting. And probably the biggest thing that Basecamp believe here is that they hate the idea of backlogs. 
They say backlogs make you feel guilty and just remind you of all the things you haven't got around to doing yet. Um, and they advocate that you just don't need them. Because if an idea is important enough, it will keep coming back. Just because you say no to an idea at a particular time, if customers keep on reporting it, you don't need a backlog to remind you of that because you're going to keep on hearing it from your customers anyway. So that idea will keep coming back. Next up, obviously, a bet has a payoff, and that is something meaningful and valuable at the end. So we, if you're going to bet a certain amount of time um, on a particular piece of work, you want the payoff to be essentially valuable software for your users at the end of it. And finally, they only bet one cycle at a time. So you can't bet three or four months on some massive project. You have to work out how can we scope this down into something that we can fit into this six week time box and then we can potentially bet on that. And then finally, probably the most interesting bit for most of us here as engineers is the building section. And the interesting thing here is that they hand over full responsibility for a given project to the team that is actually building it. So that team gets to define their own tasks. They're not receiving a massive list of JIRA tickets from someone up in an ivory tower somewhere. That team also has the power to reduce the scope of the project if they feel they need to. So if three weeks into a six week project and they're a few days behind schedule, they might say, this thing that in the pitch we said would be a nice to have and we'll do it if we have time, they might say that's not important enough right now, we're not going to do it. And by far and away the most important thing here is that there's a commitment from everyone else surrounding that team that that team is not interrupted during a build cycle to give them the best chance of shipping on time. So there's no spending a couple of days fixing a little bug here or dealing with a feature request for a large account customer or anything like that. Because if you've shaped a piece of work to fit into that six week time box and you then take three days away from the team to deal with something else, all of a sudden that their ability to ship that on time is then at risk because you've blown the time box out of the water. So those are the three main stages, shaping, betting and building. But if we look at it at a higher level, it's all about targeting and mitigating risk. So we mitigate risk early on by doing the shaping process to solve open problems and untangle dependencies before we start working on things. We mitigate risk during planning by never committing more than six weeks to any given idea and by default not giving an extension to any projects that don't finish within that six weeks. Instead, what we do is you take the learnings from that six weeks that you've spent on a project Chances are there were some problems or dependencies that you hadn't foreseen in advance, and you use that to then reshape the work um, and then potentially bet on it again in the future. And then obviously we mitigate risk during building by handing over responsibility to, to the team, not interrupting them, and then integrating design and engineering early on, getting one piece working quickly, and then iterating on that. So that's a whistle stop tour. Um, of shape up. Um, there's a lot more um, to it than that, and I can answer questions on that at the end. But I now want to talk about how we ended up um, using the technique in the governance team. So on every Monday morning, we have 10% um, sharing time where we all grab a coffee um, and spend half an hour talking about what we did in the previous 10% time. And a few months ago, I came to the team um, and said, I've reread shape up. And I really think this idea of shaping work in advance could be really powerful for us. Um, and based off of that, we then did a book club and decided to run an experiment um, using the technique. And this is what the first couple of weeks looked like, because we needed to get into a position where we'd done some pitches and we decided what we were going to build. So on the first day, we, as a team, we chatted about what problems do we actually want to try and solve? We then spent the next three days um, drafting pitches for those problems. And then on the Friday morning, we got together as a team and we reviewed all those pitches. Any issues that were identified there were then um, addressed and the pitches were refined um, at the beginning of the second week. And then towards the end, we decided what we were actually going to build um, in our first build cycle. Um, so I mentioned earlier, 
um, the notion of a pitch, and that's the write-up of a shaped piece of work. Um, I want to quickly go through the structure of a pitch now, because there's five main things that you need to have in there. First of all, the problem. What is it that we're actually trying to solve? What is the user pain or the user need? Next up, the appetite. How long do we actually want to spend on this particular thing? Based on the appetite, what is the solution that we want to try and implement? The next top bit is rabbit holes. So these are kind of areas where we could get buried down in the weeds and just spend ages going around in circles. And we want to address those early on and say, for this particular area, this is what we're going to do to kind of stop those that going around in circles before it has a chance to start. And then finally, no goes. These are kind of little bits that you might tack on to a feature, you know, if we have time, but you can say early on, you know, we're just not going to do these at all. They're not important enough right now. Now, when it comes to sketching out a solution, one of the techniques I really like from ShapeUp is something called a fat marker sketch. And this is a sketch made with such broad strokes that adding detail is either difficult or completely impossible. As an example, try and imagine drawing a really detailed UI design on a small post-it note with a really fat tipped um, Sharpie marker. It's really difficult. And that can be really powerful because it stops you going too high fidelity too soon. You have to focus on conveying the core concepts of what it is that you want to add to the product without specifying this is the exact size and location of this button and this text and this checkbox. And here is an example um, of one of the fat marker sketches that we used. As you can see, it's very rough um, because I apparently can't write in straight lines without having a piece of paper there. <laughs> um, and the core concept from this fat marker sketch is the checkbox for auto apply. Um, it's not overly specific about where that checkbox has to be or where the other components have to be on the screen, but it still conveys the core idea of, we want to add a checkbox to this form. And here is where we actually put that fat marker sketch into a full pitch. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this right now. There's a link to this pitch at the end of the slideshow, which I can share, but you can see that we've got those five main areas. So we've got the problem where we've referenced some usage data, We've got an appetite, we've got a solution where we've done some sketches, and we've even talked about a technical investigation we've done. We've got some sections on rabbit holes and no-go areas, so on and so forth. So that's how we went from first discovering this technique to actually trying to use it. And I now want to go through how we felt it actually went. So on the whole, it's been going pretty well. We delivered our first project, which was automatic application of suggestions on time, and it's proven really valuable to customers. Um, in the, I think about maybe six or seven weeks since we've shipped it, um, our users have used the feature to automatically tag almost 200,000 columns across their estates. And you can imagine how long that would have taken them to do manually. So it's, so far things are going really, really well with that particular feature. We did have to reduce the scope slightly to hit that deadline. So we removed the undo functionality that you saw on the pitch previously. Um, but since we've shipped it, none of those users have asked for the undo functionality. So chances are it might not have been as important enough in the first place. And this reminds me of a quote that I read in an article from Buffer. And that is the minimum version of any given feature is 20% the size of the initial scope yet it still delivers around 80% of the intended value. So chances are you don't have to focus on doing every single little thing for it. Um, and I think this really, really rings true with a lot of the work that we do at Redgate. After that first two week build, um, build project, we also had four weeks left in that cycle and we used that to complete a research project. Um, so this included research planning, we had some research calls, some usability testing, and then some research analysis. And we did as much of that as possible as a team. Um, and we've then used that to shape a new piece of work, which is really exciting. It's basically machine learning and data scanning in data catalog. Um, and we're now halfway through building the first iteration of that feature. Um, so it really shows the advantage for us of doing that work up front to shape it into a time box that you think you can deliver. 
um, and stay tuned for updates on how that feature pans out over the next few weeks. Um, now, it wasn't all sunshine, rainbows and daisies. There were a few problems that we identified um, after the first couple of cycles. So the first one is that our team is, we're massive proponents of doing things in a mob or an ensemble, whatever your preferred term is. But shaping tends to encourage solo or maybe pair work, and we weren't necessarily massive fans of that. We also found that having too many pitches put forward at any one time meant that there wasn't enough time to review them all fairly and in enough detail. And that because different pitches were written by different authors, they were often quite hard to compare and link back to our user needs. So we've made some changes um, since we identified those problems um, that we're hoping will actually solve them. So first off, anyone can still submit a pitch, but we now dedicate an hour every Friday morning to review and refine these pitches as a team so we can get early feedback on them. And we found this really useful because we've been having great discussions around these pitches and we're ending up with much stronger pitches as a result. And what we're also finding is that our pitches are ending up in a state where they're ready to bet on well in advance of when we actually need to decide what are we going to build next. So for an example, we've got maybe five weeks until the beginning of our next build cycle, but I think we've got at least two or three pitches that we've refined and reviewed as a team and we're happy to bet on them now. So these changes seem to be really helping, um, but obviously we'll continue to iterate on these as we go through. So that's how um, we've been using the shape up technique and how we've iterated and how we're looking to roll it out more permanently as part of our working practices. The last section of my talk is going to cover some common questions that I feel um, some of you may already have swimming around in your head based on what I've already said. So first off, how does this technique work with OKRs? Now, personally, I believe that shape up can fit just hand in hand with OKRs. And a really easy way of thinking about it is when you're either writing a pitch or you're considering betting on a pitch, if you decide to try shape up, just ask yourself, if this project was a success, do I feel it would move the needle on any of our key results? If the answer to that is yes, then you can probably bet on it with a reasonable degree of confidence that it's gonna be valuable and it's gonna help you towards your objective. If the answer is no, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad pitch. It just might mean that it's not the right time to bet on that piece of work. So as an example, our objective for the data catalog at the moment is to drastically reduce the amount of time it takes users to classify their estate. We want them to be able to classify 90% of their estate in a single afternoon. Now, one of us could easily write a pitch going, I think we should add um, Oracle capabilities to data catalog. Now that might be a really powerful feature for those particular customers, but it's not gonna move the needle on our objective of reducing the amount of time it takes to classify. So it might well be that now's not the right time to bet on Oracle, but maybe in a few months time, we might have moved on from this current objective and then that pitch might make sense. Next, how do we know that we're actually delivering valuable work? You know, my title at the beginning was shipping work that matters. So making sure that it's valuable feels like an important part of that. Um, the main thing that we do here is um, as part of every pitch, we add an additional section that Basecamp don't talk about, which is where we define the success criteria for our projects. Um, so we say, we will know that this project has been successful when we've seen these changes in user behavior. Um, obviously, as part of that, you need to make sure your usage reporting is in a good state. Um, you know, make sure that you've got dashboards and stuff set up for that. Um, so that's something we've done. And we now review that data on a weekly basis just to make sure that everyone's on the same page about the uptake of our new features. Next up, how do we balance this with support work um, and other responsibilities? Now, this one's a really interesting one for me because anyone that's worked with me knows I'm a big believer in something called the zero bug policy. Um, and that's where if a bug is reported to you and you decide it's important enough to fix, you drop what you're doing and you fix it right away. 
Um, and that doesn't fit in particularly well with the don't interrupt the team while they're building something approach. Um, Basecamp put it quite nicely and they say that just because something is a bug doesn't automatically make it more important than everything else. And it definitely doesn't give you permission to interrupt the team when they're building something. Now, there might be the odd case when you have a bug that's impacting lots of customers and it's stopping them getting any kind of work done. And in those very rare scenarios, it's probably OK to down tools for a few days, get that thing fixed and shipped and then come back to what you were working on. But that should definitely be the exception rather than the rule. Next up, what about if I have multiple teams all working on the same product? This is particularly relevant for something like SQL Monitor here at Redgate, where we've got three full development teams working on it. So Basecamp themselves, um, up until recently, only had one product called Basecamp, and they seemed to make it work with having multiple teams all working on the same product. Admittedly, those teams were smaller than we have at Redgate. Um, but I don't see something like this being too much of an issue. I think if you have teams with maybe vastly different objectives about what they want to do, it might require a little bit of collaboration and communication to make sure they're not stepping on one another's toes. Um, but to be honest, I, I don't see it being too much of a problem. And I think it's something that could work with multiple teams. And then finally, does anybody else actually work this way or is it just Basecamp that are weird and decide to work in these six week cycles? The answer to this is no, there are many other companies um, that I found that work this way. The best two, or well, the two best known ones I should say are Buffer, you saw a quote from them earlier, and Intercom, um, the software that puts that little chat button in the bottom of pretty much every website you ever go on. Um, and if you Google um, kind of six month cycles software development, there's a whole host of different things on there where you can find out about other companies um, who have found this approach to work. So that's pretty much everything I had to share with you. Um, there's some links here for further reading if anyone is interested. So we've got a link to the Shape Up web book, some blog posts from Intercom and Buffer um, on how they found working in six week cycles and also a link to the pitch that I shared earlier, if anyone wants to read it in more detail. So thank you very much for your time and for listening. Um, I'm now more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, got a question if that's OK, Tom? Yep. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned there that you did your two week little batch work and then you rolled in some research at the end of that to test that solution how much of that was discovery for the next thing that would drive a pitch if you see what i mean it feels like you're doing solution okay. research there not necessarily finding out the next thing to pitch on is there a yeah. balance there? ah so I'm, i might have misspoke then during the talk so that six week project the first two weeks we spent building the automatic application of suggestions, um, which was something that we'd, we'd done kind of the solution exploration for that several months earlier and just hadn't yeah. got around to building it. Um, the four week research project that we did after was something that was kind of brand new. That was the whole, the machine learning side of things. Right. Um, that was where we weren't really sure what it was, we, what we wanted to build there. We knew we kind of wanted to do something um, but we didn't quite know what, so that's what we used that four weeks for. Oh, okay, so the research there both tested what you'd done and fed into the next thing that you were going to pitch on. Am I right in thinking that? Um, the research wasn't testing the the automatic application stuff. We're still looking. We're, we've been doing some quantitative analysis on that feature. We're still looking at organising some qualitative analysis for that at the moment. And um, obviously, the team's been quite busy, so trying to. Yeah trying to balance building new things, deciding what to build next, and also reviewing things you've already built um, is kind of quite, quite a fine balance. <laughs> cool. Bunch of other questions coming in on the chat. Dan, should I just go through those one by one? Yeah, go for it, Tom. Cool, all right, I'm gonna go from the top. 
Uh, Stephen is asking which one of my two truths and a lie was the lie. I'll answer that later. <laughs> um, Simon has asked, how much time did it take to prepare the pitch? Um, so that one's an interesting one because I think it depends, it, or it, so far it has depended on how much prior research had been done for a particular thing. So for the automatic application of suggestions, we've done quite a lot of research in advance for that and kind of just pulling all of that together with the usage data um, didn't really take too long. Like we managed to put it together in a week or so. Um, for the machine learning um, project that we're now working on, we were basically starting from square one. So that one took, you know, a, a good few weeks to get into a state where we were happy enough with the technical aspects of it, the commercial aspects of it, um, and the design aspects of it to actually um, to go forward. Um, so it, it does depend on what it is that you're planning to build, I think. So we've got another question from uh, Rob. So what happens to pitches that don't make it onto the cycle? You mentioned yep. no backlogs. So curious as to whether you throw away those pitches or if they get resurrected later. Yeah, that's another great question. So. So far, our process for that um, has been um, to basically take anything that, oh, one second, come here. No, nope, all right, it's over there. Sorry, demanding puppy. <laughs> so what we've, what we've generally done is taken any pitch that didn't make it through, we've automatically put it up for, kind of up for tender in the next build cycle. Um, and sort of try to refine the pitches that way because we haven't got that many ongoing ones at the moment. Um, I think if we get to a point where there's a larger number of them that we have to try and deal with, then we might um, look at deciding, you know, are we ever likely to bet on this one anytime soon? Um, and if not, whether to sort of throw it away for a while. Um, cool. Uh, another one from Fiona Tom. So, uh, is yep. it a six weeks build or six weeks including shaping, better, and building? A better, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's a good question again. So, um, generally, the idea is that um, the six weeks is purely for building. Um, one of the things I don't like about how Basecamp do things is that all of the shaping and betting is basically done by the CEO the CTO and their most senior programmer. Um, so it's kind of, it's quite an ivory tower approach where they go, you know, we've worked out that these are the most important things to build. We have decided these are the most important things to build right now. And they just pass those projects down to teams going, this is what you're gonna be doing for the next six weeks. I don't particularly like that approach, um, which is why we've been trying to do it a little bit differently by getting the rest of the team involved. Um, the hardest thing there is that how do you do the shaping without interrupting the team while it's trying to build something? Um, so that's kind of where just dedicating that one hour on a Friday morning, it doesn't take too much time away from the team while building something, but it does mean that it gets everyone involved in shaping um, a little bit earlier. So we've run out of time, Tom. I don't know whether whether you have time if we run through these questions on the recording and then people can watch it back. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to go through them all on the recording. Yeah, just as we're, I've noticed we're, we're, we're losing people through. So we'll carry on and then yeah. people can watch it back. Yeah, uh, sure. so, so, so Matt asks, um, how do you balance discovery, shaping and delivery building with the need, desire to involve all the people in all of the things? Is this concept of continuous discovery at odds with the desire to not interrupt folks during the build cycle? Yeah, that, that as, I, as I've just said in the answer to the previous question, is the tricky bit when you don't have some people who only do the shaping and the betting and then the rest of the people only do the building. Um, so that is something we've struggled with a little bit. Um, I think one of the advantages we found is that because we have, because we do a lot of mob programming, we don't necessarily need every engineer in I think we may have lost Tom. Yeah. Give us a, 
He's back. Apologies. Back. Yeah, that's mine. Thankfully, it's done it after my talk is finished and not during it. Um, yeah, this one's tricky. Um, we found that because we do a lot of mod programming, it's made it a bit easier for us because we can have like a couple of engineers can splinter off um, with our designers, for instance, and attend a research call or something like that. Or they can go and spend some time with the product manager or the tech lead to work on a little bit of a shaping project while the build thing is still moving forward. Um, but yeah, that is one of the one of the hardest things I think to balance. Um, because I think if if at, if at Redgate we went kind of the full base camp approach, what you'd basically end up with is the product leadership team of tech lead, product designer, product manager. They do all the research, they do all the pitches, they'd pick what was most important, and then they just go to five engineers, here's what you're building, sort of thing. And that's definitely not the way we want to do stuff at Redgate. Um, so that that balance is something we're, we're definitely still trying to work out. Okay. Uh, Stefano asks, if we figured out the building stage that we've made a mistake on shaping or betting, is there a way to recover from that situation? Um, so I think depending on the definition of mistake, if we like, if we found out, for instance, that what we thought we'd be able to fit into six weeks is actually going to take nine weeks, for instance, that's where giving the team the authority to reduce the scope is really useful. So the team can work out, you know, is there a version of this that is still valuable that we can deliver in six weeks? Um, in terms of betting, that one's quite hard because you often won't know whether you've bet on the wrong thing until you've actually shipped something and found out whether users actually want it or will use it. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to recover from that stage. But by making sure that you only ever bet six weeks in advance, um, Basecamp say like the most we will ever lose on any given project is six weeks. Which, while it's not great because six weeks worth of a full development team's time is quite a lot, um, it's not it's not necessarily as bad as doing like a six a six month rebuild of a project and then find out that we're back in the same place we were at the beginning. Okay. Uh, Neil asks, sounds awfully like six weeks agile sprint with a very small backlog, i.e., bets, or am I missing something? Um, am I missing something? That's an interesting one, because yeah, I think it depends on how much you, I think for me, the biggest difference between a sprint and the way Shape Up Advocate's working is in the the initial work that shaping work that you do up front um, my experience of working in sprints is that a lot of the time those problems and like rabbit holes and stuff that you run into you only find those out like halfway through a sprint when you're trying to build something you don't consider those as much up front um, but i guess i guess in a way a six-week agile sprint is what is one way of actually looking at it yeah okay um, if we only interrupt the team for critical bugs, how do we address product debt that builds up? Um, so that is where the, um, the cool down period comes in. So you have that two weeks after the end of every six weeks um, where you can address some of that. Um, one of the things that I think you can also do, and they don't talk about a huge amount um, in the book is there's nothing stopping us from kind of putting our own Redgate twist on this technique and actually going, if we've got product debt, why not shape, try and shape that into a two week or a six week project? And then we can bet on that just as we would a feature. Because I, as I think Neil's trying to advocate there is that product debt is just as important as new feature development. Um, so while they only really talk about using it to deliver new features in the book, I, I think you can you can apply the same process to 
kind of paying down technical debt, design debt, all of that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, one final question from Simon. Uh, how mm -hmm. do people outside the team make pitches, help with shaping, etc.? Um, Simon, is that in terms of like maybe people from, I know you're still on the call, is that in terms of like people from sales or like marketing or anything like that? Just could you elaborate a little bit on the question? Um, I guess I was seeing it as a sort of a bit of a selfish question and like how okay. can my team start to use this where we get quite a lot of requests from around the business. Um, yeah. But yes, I imagine. So, you know, if you've got a, you know, a sales team who are seeing a particular problem and would like to pitch for it to be fixed or yeah, yeah. you know I could see marketing saying they want to move into this particular area or I guess even um, kind of wider product management although I guess they'd probably go through your product manager wouldn't they though but uh, yeah so yeah. yeah I think again that that's a really interesting one I think one thing again and a lot of this comes back to like not necessarily trying to follow the approach by the book. Like we don't follow Scrum by the book, so why would we do Shape Up by the book? I think if when it comes to trying to write a pitch, like if if the team is hearing a lot from sales or marketing, you know this thing is really hurting us, then the team maybe goes, okay, well let's come up with a pitch, try and come up with a pitch around that, and then if we want to make that pitch as strong as possible, then you want to bring in the people that have the most information and the most knowledge about that. And if that means that you have to get a mix of marketers, account execs, support people, and the main product team in a room to work on a pitch, then I don't see why we, we shouldn't do that. Um, it's not something we've really done yet um, because we're only a few months into it. Um, and I think, yeah, something like this would be particularly interesting for, for the core teams where kind of requests are kind of flying in from a lot more places than they maybe are for our typical product development teams. I hope that sort of answers the question. Cool. cool. All right, guys, I think that draws to the end. I think we're out of questions there, Tom. Uh, yep, sounds good. Pup puppy kicked out the network cable. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> cool thank you very much everyone and enjoy the rest of the day thanks guys thanks